For our first kind of circulatory disorder that we want to talk about, we're getting into vascular heart disease. So we're concerned about kind of how circulation is going through the heart. The most common of these being a mitral valve prolapse. So typically when the heart contracts, the pressure in the chamber of the heart that's contracting facilitates closure of the valve from the place where blood was before that contraction. So when the ventricles contract, that's gonna facilitate closure of the atrial valves. When the atria contract, that's gonna facilitate closure of our ventricular valves. So that's one of the things we do want to keep in mind uh, because one of the, this is the one we're gonna focus in on, which is the mitral valve, which goes between the left chambers of the heart, the left atria and the left ventricle. Normally, when these valves are pushed back together and close, that's what creates our S1, S2 sounds that we're listening for when we do our cardiac exam. Mitral valve is the one that's most likely to develop a problem. And the problem that we develop is called a mitral valve prolapse with or without regurgitation. This is a mitral valve murmur. So what happens is that that valve, it doesn't snap shut like this when the contraction happens, it tends to blow out so it goes shut and then flaps open. So when the ventricles contract, they eject blood out the aortic valve to the body, but they also push blood back up into the left atrium because there's not, that chamber doesn't close, or those, I'm sorry, those valves don't close, preventing that regurgitation. So the regurgitation refers to the blood flow backwards in the normal flow of blood within the heart. For our assessment of valvular heart disease or, you know, or mitral valve prolapses, we're looking for an abnormal thickening of the valve. So if it gets too thick, it's not able to seal very well, which can lead to that mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation. And MVP is one of the abbreviations you guys may see written in documentation that stands for mitral valve prolapse. Um, this thickening of the valves is what we call a stenosis. Stenosis just means a narrowing of a normally open lumen within the circulatory system. So we can see this in the peripheral vascular system, which we're gonna look at in a little while, and we can see it in the heart, specifically around the valves. This impairs cardiac stroke volume, so the amount of blood that's ejected when the, when the heart contracts, uh, when the mu heart muscle contracts. Um, so that can affect both the atria and the ventricles. And then regurgitation, we talked about, it's caused by that incomplete closure of the valves, which leads to blood flowing backwards in the normal circulatory direction. So it's that flow of blood from the ventricles to the atria, not just from the atria to the ventricles. The etiology of these mitral valve prolapses, um, so a couple different ways. One is congenital. You can be born with a mitral valve prolapse. Um, this happens in about two to 3% of the population. So it's not terribly common that people are born with a heart valve disorder uh, or with a mitral valve prolapse um, or acquired. So one of the big ways, rheumatic heart disease. So it's an infectious process that patients can get early on in their life that leads to cardiac inflammation. Uh, so rheumatic fever, and then they can end up with valve damage long-term. Endocarditis, so inside the heart itis, inflammation, can cause that. We're gonna be talking about that in a later section and how that can lead to this valvular disorder. And then calcification, which can happen over time. So we're accustomed to hearing about calcification of arteries, which is that narrowing or stenosing of arteries in the body that can occur with age. That can also happen to the heart valves, which can lead to a mitral valve prolapse. So here's just kind of a big disorder around all the different kinds of aortic versus mitral kind of problems that we can have and where in the heart they really affect. Uh, so left atria for a mitral stenosis caused by hypertrophy, meaning swelling of that area. Um, the symptoms or the presentation can be around atrial fibrillation, which is an electrical disorder, pulmonary hypertension, which is 
increased blood pressure coming out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary system, or straight up heart failure, you know, a disorder of circulating volume. Our mitral, mitral regurgitation, again, affecting the left atria um, from enlargement. Um, so then we get our etiologies of where each one of these things falls, the distinct symptoms that patients may have around each one of these different disorders, and then the assessment that you may see. So whether or not they're gonna have a diastolic or a systolic murmur related to what type of kind of heart disorder they have around circulation within the heart. For our vascular heart assessment, the big thing we're looking for is we've got this classic triad of symptoms that we see for patients with a mitral valve prolapse. So they can present with chest pain, syncope, which is a fancy way of saying passing out. It's syncope is kind of that, uh, you guys ever get up from the couch too quickly and the world starts going dark and you feel like you're gonna pass out? That's what we call pre-syncope. If you were to actually pass out, that's syncope. And then heart failure. So heart failure is a different disease, but that classic triad of symptoms for patients with a mitral valve prolapse, they look like they have heart failure. They look like they have a circulating volume overload. And then we need to determine, do they look like they have a left versus a right-sided heart failure? For mitral valve prolapse, that's gonna affect one side of the heart, specifically the ventricular side of the heart. So they're going to have a diastolic murmur meaning that they're gonna have usually an S2 murmur. So what you're gonna hear is, there can be some confusion with health assessment um, around how you hear a murmur. A murmur is not an additional heart sound. So it's not like there's an S3 or an S4 and that's the murmur. Traditionally, when we talk about murmurs or when you guys are gonna hear murmurs on patients, the murmur is going to replace either the S1 or the S2. So for patients with a uh, mitral valve prolapse or an S2 murmur, they're gonna sound like boomush, uh, boomush, 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 which is gonna be kind of the heartbeat sound that they're gonna have. An S1 murmur would sound like whoosh boom, whoosh boom, whoosh boom, whoosh boom, whoosh boom. So you're not, you're not adding an additional heart sound, you're just replacing their normal S1 or S2. So for these patients, one of the, a couple of the big problems is they can have shortness of breath overnight. So we do need to be assessing for how well they're sleeping. Are they waking up coughing? That coughing is part of that heart failure presentation. And then kind of what symptoms do they present with? Do they have respiratory symptoms associated with this presentation of heart failure and murmur? So things like shortness of breath, especially when laying down, they can also have crackles in their lungs from the kind of the backup of fluid or that pulmonary hypertension that can develop. So for our assessment, we're really focused on two big body systems. One is our respiratory system. The other is our cardiovascular exam. So our cardiovascular exam is both our heart exam and our peripheral cardiovascular exam. So we need to look for pulses. The other big thing we wanna look for is edema in the lower extremities. Because we know that this does mimic heart failure, we wanna be assessing for some of those symptoms that can look like heart failure. We as nurses, we're going to be able to differentiate whether a patient has congestive heart failure versus a mitral valve prolapse when we do our cardiac exam. We listen to the heart valves and we're listening for that murmur. Medically, doctors are doing some different stuff. So first, screening for patients, or trying to identify risk of having a mitral valve prolapse. We're gonna, they're gonna be doing a medical history. So looking at childhood illnesses, do they have a rheumatic fever that's more likely to produce some of the, the, um, the long-term uh, mitral valve prolapse? Also recent dental work. Here's one of the crazy things about dental work is that uh, what the blood in the body that damaged the mouth, the blood that is produced in the mouth tends to go to the heart next. So patients with very poor oral hygiene and then have dental work done, so they're having damage to their oral mucosa, tend to have bacteria dislodge, enter the circulatory system, and then settle in the heart onto the heart valves. 
And the mitral valve is one of those valves that you know, tends to be one of the more dangerous ones that patients have, uh, have what we call vegetation on. So vegetation, just that bacterial growth. Uh, so recent dental work is one of those screening things or questions that we do ask patients to determine their risk of having a mitral valve prolapse. Then their review of systems, so their entire body exam, focusing in on the cardiac, respiratory, and vascular assessments. For diagnosis, we wanna visualize that heart valve not shutting appropriately. We wanna see those valves flapping and the blood regurgitating. So the big way we're gonna do that is with our echoes, our echocardiograms. So those are ultrasounds that we take of the heart to visualize both the structural components of the heart and blood actually flowing through the heart. When you guys are in clinicals, if you get a chance to see an echo done, do it, because they are super cool. You can actually visualize the heart beating and blood flowing from the atria to the ventricles, from the ventricles out into the body. It's very, very cool. So the two we need to focus in on is, are a TTE, which are a transthoracic echo. So transthoracic across the thorax. So this is where the ultrasound probe is placed on the sternum or on the chest. Not so on the sternum, because you can't see well through bone. Uh, but they're gonna do it from outside the chest wall, so it's a non-invasive procedure, and look at the heart. So your ultrasound machine would be out here, outside the body, looking in this way. The other type of echo that can be done is a transesophageal echo. So for this one, a patient has to be sedated, and it's almost like an endoscopy, where we're gonna put down our ultrasound probe through the mouth, in the esophagus, to right behind the level of the heart and they're actually gonna do the ultrasound internally. These tend to be slightly higher resolution ultrasounds that we use for very advanced disease or very precise measurement. A lot of the times patients can have transthoracic echoes done uh, that are non-invasive. They don't have to be NPO. They don't have to have any sedation, any of that stuff. So there's a much easier way to do an echo. The other is cardiac monitoring. So we're probably gonna have patients with mitral valve prolapse, especially if it's an acute or a new diagnosis on EKG monitoring uh, or telemetry monitoring. They may also be on what's called a Holter monitor. So Holter monitors are like a telemetry monitor that we use in the hospital, the five lead monitor that takes a look at their electrical activity of their heart. But patients go home with these. These are kind of the home use version of that type of device. So patients will go home with the device hooked up. They'll usually keep it on for 24 to 48 hours. Then they bring the entire device back to their cardiologist office where the data is analyzed to see if there's any electrical abnormalities in the way that their heart is working. So common nursing diagnoses. We've got this uh, mitral valve prolapse really does hit a few different body systems. So it's heart, lungs, and circulatory system. So we actually have quite a few nursing diagnoses that we focus in on for valvular heart disease kind of problems. So first and foremost, uh, altered cardiac output. Because of that mitral valve prolapse, these patients are much, much more likely to have altered cardiac output. Um, peripheral, um, just drew a blank on what it is. Um, Altered tissue perfusion because of some of the edema that can develop distally from that heart failure presentation. Um, impaired gas exchange from some of the backup of pressure into the lungs. So some of the crackling that you may appreciate could be caused from pulmonary hypertension or alter impaired gas exchange. Um, activity intolerance is a big one because patients don't have as much cardiac output. They're not able to manage some of those stressful uh, times where the body requires better peripheral tissue perfusion. So for the medical plan, what they're gonna do about this. First and foremost, least invasive, we wanna do our diuretics. So things like furosemide, spironolactone, some of our diuretics that are gonna cause patients to urinate out a bunch of fluid. This is to help manage some of the congestive heart failure or uh, CHF presentation associated with valvular disorders. And then we've got our blood thinners. So anytime blood pools in the body, it's at a, or stops moving, it's at very high risk for clotting. 
anytime blood doesn't move, it clots. Think about blood that sits outside your skin after you get a cut. If it just sits there, it clots quicker. So blood thinners are a big one that we want to give patients because as we have that regurgitation of blood in the heart, that pooling of blood in the, in the uh, left atria for our mitral valve prolapse is very much more likely to clot or coagulate than if somebody had a normal functioning kind of one direction of fl circulatory flow through the heart. So drugs like warfarin, Xarelto, also antihypertensives. So one of the things that uh, the body tends to do if it knows it doesn't have enough cardiac output or if it's sensing an impaired tissue perfusion to the organ systems or the body is that it'll increase the heart rate. So patients may have a baseline high heart rate. And beta blockers are one of those drugs that helps, it works in between our T wave and our P wave, so in between our cardiac cycles, so it can slow down our heart rate. Surgical repair is really kind of the terminal repair or fix for mitral valve prolapse, and that can be done a couple different ways. Um, you can have either porcine or pork valves, so there are biological valves that are placed, or we can have mechanical heart valves. Uh, mechanical valves are super trippy. If you ever have a patient with a mechanical valve, when you listen to their heart, you're not gonna hear boom, 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 which is what you would hear if they had a porcine valve or a pork uh, pig heart valve placed. I think they can also do bovine valves now, so they, those are from cows. But these are biological valves. Those are gonna sound like normal S1, S2. For the mechanical ones that are metal, they're gonna sound like a click. So it's like a It's like a, uh, it's like trying to coordinate like the, the mouth versus the snap kind of thing. So it's like a boom, 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 boom. Now I'm snapping terribly. But it's a clicking sound that you're gonna hear associated with where that mechanical valve is in their heart. Um, one of the big things, anytime you put a foreign body inside a human, it's very, very likely to do two things. One is harbor bacteria. So there's very high risk of getting infected if there's any foreign body that's implanted in somebody. The other is blood clots. So it triggers that inflammatory response. The body recognizes there's something that it wasn't born with in there and it launches an inflammatory response against it. So there's a high risk of blood clots associated with any type of uh, implanted device that stays in a patient long term. So anticoagulation therapy is a big deal for patients with these uh, valve replacements. So for our nursing plan, the things that we need to prepare to do, there's a lot of assessment that we do with these patients. So cardiac assessment, heart sounds, and rhythm. So do they have a normal S1, S2, and is it regular? Meaning boom, 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 boom. That's a regular rhythm. Or is it something like boom, 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 boom. That would be an irregular rhythm. Uh, then our respiratory sounds, we're listening for adventitious lung sounds. Adventitious, that doesn't describe any one lung sound, that's all the abnormal lung sounds. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying, it ain't good. But the big one we're listening for, for our respiratory exam around mitral valve prolapse is crackles in the lungs uh, from that uh, pulmonary hypertension. And then our vascular exam, so we're looking for things like peripheral and pulmonary edema. So pulmonary is gonna be, again, we're, it's kind of a twofer when we're gonna listen for the symptoms of pulmonary edema. For peripheral edema, we're gonna palpate and look to measure plus one, two, three, how deep or present is the peripheral edema. And one other thing when you're measuring peripheral edema, especially in the legs, is you wanna figure out how far up the legs do they go. So is it just in their foot? Does it go mid shin, up to the knee, up to the hip? How high up their body? do they have peripheral edema? Star stethoscope, it's our big tool for any of our valvular disorders. Implementation for patients with valvular disorders, we gotta do this a couple different ways. One is we need to support 
the medical stuff that's gonna go on so that we can get definitive diagnosis and identify the problem that our patient has. So that's done, we need to prepare and monitor our patient through those procedures. So for our echoes, for our transthoracic echocardiogram, we do wanna let them know that this is an external procedure, that there's gonna be an ultrasound placed on their chest. Um, for women, they do need to have some access to areas around their breast in order to gain an accurate exam. So it's a good thing to warn patients that that kind of exposure is gonna be necessary for that transthoracic echo. Um, the other for the transesophageal, this is a conscious sedation procedure. So these patients are going to go off unit to be sedated to have this procedure done. So we do need to let them know that there is going to be some sedation given. There does need to be consent for this procedure obtained ahead of time. So a lot of our periop cycle does apply to transthoracic echocardiograms because they will be sedated and they will be, they're not intubated, but they are gonna have a tube or the ultrasound probe placed in their esophagus. So it's a kind of a pseudo intubation. Having kind of a scratchy throat afterwards can be common from that tube insertion. And then surgical support. So if the patient's gonna have a full valve replacement, we need to let them know what that's gonna look like. This is a, is a, it's a minor, if, if you can use the word minor, around open heart procedure, but it is an open heart procedure. They do need to get into the heart in order to replace that valve. So we do need to prepare that patient for that pretty significant intervention uh, that's gonna help them. Other things that we need to focus on for this type of patient when planning care, teaching. Teaching is a big one, especially dental safety. These patients, if they have a mechanical or uh, any type of artificial valve placed, they need to have very, very kind of high sensitivity around dental work. Usually before they go to the dentist, they're gonna to have to be on prophylactic antibiotics for a couple days to prevent that risk of migration of oral bacteria to vegetate on those valves, because we do know that is a risk for how they can develop mitral valve prolapse in the first place. We don't wanna ruin any of the surgical interventions that have been done to correct this problem. So very, very sensitive around antibiotic stuff uh, for dental work. Also anticoagulation therapy. They are gonna be on this long term, whether they have valve replacement or not. Because of that pooling of blood for a mit active mitral valve prolapse, high risk of coagulation. And here's the bummer, is that if they develop a clot, it's gonna be in the left atria. If that clot dislodges and starts following regular circulatory pattern, the next place it goes is the left ventricle. After that, it gets ejected out into the body. The first branching off the aorta are your carotid arteries. So they're gonna to go to the brain. So there's a very, very high risk of stroke associated with patients who are non-compliant with anticoagulation therapy from a mitral valve prolapse. So this is a long-term something we need to assess whenever we're working with these types of patients. And then post-op instructions, um, if they have the full valve replacement, so they've had surgery. Um, signs and symptoms of infection, that's always something we wanna teach anybody who has any kind of impaired tissue integrity uh, while they're, or impaired skin integrity while they're in seeking care is you know, if they have signs and symptoms of infection, what should they look for and what should they do about it? When should they come back to the clinic to be looked at? When should they go to the emergency room? And then no lifting heavy objects. Because this is kind of a, it's gonna compromise the thorax, we don't want patients lifting things and increasing their intrathoracic or intra-abdominal pressure because that can help to kind of rupture that, in, that wound. So no lifting heavy objects for a period of weeks after any of these surgical interventions. For evaluation, we wanna look out for cardiac complications. If things are going well, um, we need to make sure that the heart is managing either the abnormality that it has or the new biological kind of flow of blood that it's been given. So we need to do things like encourage periods of rest for these patients, especially if they have a prolapse, meaning they're still having regurgitation of blood between the left and right, or I'm sorry, left atria and ventricles. So what that can mean is we need to decrease cardiac oxygen demand. If these patients go exercising, they don't have enough cardiac output to properly vascularize or uh, 
not vascularize, but perfuse the heart itself so they can develop cardiac ischemia as a result of just having poor cardiac output. So we do need to encourage them to build in periods of rest when they are being active. Also medication compliance, big, 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 big deal, especially those anticoagulants. We do not want these patients developing clots and stroking out on us. And then we need to look for complications or advancement of the disease. So signs and symptoms of vascular compromise, we want to ease circulation. If they're having shortness of breath, if they're having symptoms of mitral valve prolapse, we want to lay the bed down, get them sitting in a, in a sitting position so that they're not, or laying position rather, so that they're as, uh, the words are hard. We want to, <laughs> let me try this again. We want to lay them down to decrease vascular resistance. If they're laying flat, the body doesn't have to work as hard to do circulation systemically. So if we lay our patients down, that's gonna facilitate or ease circulation. They don't have to have as much cardiac output in order to adequately perfuse all their tissues. That time I got through it. All right guys, so that's mitral valve prolapse. And next we're gonna be looking at some inflammatory disorders around the circulatory system in the heart.